This was the Grand Central Station of the Underground Railroad, and you'll learn more about its conductor today on Indiana Outdoors. Hi, I'm Don Van Meter, co-host of Indiana Outdoors. And I'm Jill Dittmeyer. Today we're in Wayne County in Fountain City, but it used to be called Newport. That's when abolitionist Levi Coffin lived here back in the 1820s. Quakers like Coffin moved to Newport from the south to protest slavery. This house was known as the Grand Central Station of the Underground Railroad, helping over 2,000 runaway slaves to freedom. Mm -hmm. We're going to learn a little bit more about Levi Coffin in a few minutes. But first, a movie legend who was born right here oh. in Indiana is remembered every year at a festival in Fairmount. James Dean made only three films in his short life, but they sure had an impact on his fans. Oh, they sure did. I think it was his rebellious attitude, maybe those sports cars, and definitely his good looks, Don. Like this? Hmm, I don't know. I think this is one of the festivals that you can come to and fully enjoy yourself and see a little bit of everything. Well, I'm Gail Hickory, and I'm the president of the museum, of the Fairmont Historical Museum, that is. The festival started someplace, probably with a one block area in town. And as you go through town now, you'll notice that we have about six blocks downtown and we have a 15-acre park uh, with uh, holds someplace in the neighborhood of uh, 3,000 cars. So we have a pretty good-sized uh, festival. We have approximately oh, 40,000 people that come. So you can see anything you want to see uh, any, if you just go and look. It's a 58 Caddy convertible. I did the car about five years ago. It was all in pieces when I did it. Uh, the trailer is a 62 Bambi Airstream, and uh, we made that into a 50 diner so we could be accepted into car shows. And uh, we still use it as a camper. The car I did five years ago, I took me three and a half months, and uh, the trailer took, took us about a month to build. Uh, yeah, we were kind of in a hurry. We wanted to tour the United States, so uh, we did it in the month of July. And August 1st, we left for California and around about the United States. And in two years, we put about 35,000 miles on it. The Mercury's that we have out at the park during this celebration, uh, they call it the Merc Corral. And if you remember the movie, uh, Rebel, he drove a Mercury in it. And that's where the Mercury comes from. And everybody wants a Mercury and everybody brings one. And they call it the Merc Corral. They judge them as a Merc Corral. They judge them as original. And then they also judge them uh, as chopped and lowered and, and, and fixed up really nice. Look-alike contest that we have on Saturday evening. You have a lot of people that come to that. We have probably any place from 20 to 30 people that come to this. When you look up there and you see up, see those people, they don't say a word. It's just their actions. I mean, they come up there and they hold their cigarette and they hold their head just right. It just looks like it. Some of the. Uh, Fans, of course, resemble Jimmy, especially a lot of the younger fans. I think a lot of it depends on who you are and how you look at Jimmy and think that he would look like. Uh, there's been very few that I've seen that really caught my eye and I thought, you know, they really look like Jimmy. 
we don't look at uh, Jimmy as a movie star or anything like that. Uh, he's just part of the family to us, and I know my mom and dad just considered him uh, like another son. Uh, to me, he's just Jimmy. Jim had something to do with it because of the cars. You got to remember that he raced both cars. He was killed in a Porsche. He had motorcycles. Uh, we have a big motorcycle contingency that comes in. And I think because of his interest in cars and racing, that that's the reason we have the cars. And especially the 50s cars, so that was his era. I mean, that, that was him. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, 10, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, rock. We're gonna rock around the clock tonight. Put your flat bags on, join me home. We'll have some fun when the clock strikes one. We're gonna rock. I think this is one of the festivals that you can come to and fully enjoy yourself and see a little bit of everything. Well, joining us now is Janice McGuire. She is president of the Levi Coffin House Historic Association. And we're so pleased to be here. And it's, it's strange because on one side of the street, we have the, the bustling 21st century, <laughs> the trucks and everything. And yet we step through this house that has just incredible historic significance for not only Indiana, but the United States. Yes, um, we try to take our visitors back to 1839 when the house was built and when the Coffins lived here and um, tell them the stories of Levi Coffin and the work that he did and what the fugitive slaves' lives would have been like during the time that they were here with the Coffins. And it's an incredible story and one that, uh, like you were saying, you relate every day that when people come through here. Share a little bit with our, our viewers the story of Levi Coffin and why uh, his significance. Well, Levi was known as the president of the Underground Railroad, and I think mostly because of the numbers of people that he uh, was able to help here. In the 20 years that the Coffins lived here, Levi estimates that they helped approximately 2,000 fugitive slaves, and to his knowledge, not a single one of them was ever recaptured. Mm. Tell us about some of these this, the spots that people will get to see when they come here. Well, we have one hiding place upstairs in what we call the hired girl's room, a small door that leads to a hiding place that the small door could be closed, the bed or possibly a wash stand pulled over in front of it and completely conceal the fact that it was there. We believe that that's the area that Re Levi referred to as the garret, and he says on one occasion they had 13 fugitives hiding in the garret. At one time? At one time. What was the uh, normal amount of uh, slaves here at one well, time? Well, it just depended on the situation, Levi says, that they would have only one or two, but uh, he does say that on one occasion they had 17 fugitive slaves here at one time. And, and tell everyone why this area was such a, a key location, the Grand Central Station. Uh, because of our location, there were three main routes that uh, converged here at what was then Newport, Indiana. They crossed the Ohio River from the major slaveholding areas of the South. At one of three main places, Madison or Jeffersonville, Indiana, or Cincinnati, Ohio, they would come here, and then from here there were three main routes that Levi used to send them on northward to safety in Canada. And the house itself has been restored to the way it was during those times? The house was privately owned until 1967. At that time, was restored and open to the public. Um, primarily, our um, emphasis is on sharing the history of Levi Coffin with the school children, um, but uh, with everyone, um, not in, only in Indiana because of the significance to Indiana history, but the significance to our national history as well. Now, one of the most unique things I've ever seen in a house anywhere is located down in the basement of this home. In the, the basement of the house is the kitchen and also the spring room. Um, Newport um, changed its name because of another Newport, Indiana, and the mix-up of the mail to Fountain City because we had a lot of springs. And evidently, Levi knew he had one of the springs on the property. And so the well is just simply in the basement next to the kitchen. It's something you have to come see to believe, quite <laughs> frankly, yes. that it's still there that way. Well, what is the reaction from, especially the school children? Because you do entertain a lot of school children during the year. Uh, yes, uh, thousands of school kids uh, <laughs> during the year. Um, and. Uh, the reaction is, is very good. They're, um, uh, it's very important, I think, for the school children to actually be able to come to the places where 
where the events actually took place. It's one thing to read about history in a book, mm -hmm. and it's another to be there and, and experience it and uh, be in the same rooms and, and be in the same places um, where the things that they read about actually occurred. Well, it's a fascinating tour, and we're so happy to be here today, and thank you for taking the time to, uh, to chat with us a little bit on the Thank Indiana you. Outdoors. We always enjoy sharing the the uh, history of Levi Coffin and the work that he did with one of everyone. Your, one of your favorite topics. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite topics. <laughs> Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Don, this is a false bottom wagon, and you can see that the slaves would hide in yeah. underneath here. They would put the straw on them and then take them on to their next uh, safe house or station. You know, that looks pretty crowded and uncomfortable, but I suspect that's a small price to pay for freedom. Mm -hmm. Our next story is about an archaeology dig in the Hamilton County town of Strawtown. Now, thanks to some popular movies, some people associate archaeologists with Indiana, but <laughs> a different Indiana, Indiana Jones. <laughs> yeah, but these archaeologists aren't engaged in death-defying acts or being chased by the bad guys. No, they're simply trying to learn more about the mound-building natives who were there long before there was a straw town. Well, Indiana Jones hasn't really helped us very much because it, it uh, presents that glorified view that you go out and you grab the artifact and you run, which is really contrary to the way that we as archaeologists work. You call this archaeology? Get out of here. Indiana Jones is one of those things that we've had to counter for a long time. I'm Donald R. Cochran, and I'm the director of the Archaeological Resource Management Service in the Department of Anthropology at Ball State. Right now we're involved in the, the project that uh, Hamilton County Parks and Recreation Department has in uh, near Strawtown. Uh, the project was uh, one that Bob McCullough from Indiana University, Purdue University at Fort Wayne had gotten a grant to do this past summer. The testing was his project and uh, so we were just helping out with him, helping him out. My name is Robert McCullough. I'm the director of the Indiana Purdue Fort Wayne Archaeological Survey my responsibility uh, for the quality of the work, uh, for the cataloging, the identification, and most importantly, reporting the results in the, of the investigation. This uh, vessel is a classic design and style and shape, and you see the shape of the neck, um, that would be called Fort Ancient, and they, uh, their senator, they come from Dayton, the Cincinnati area. This is a classic, classic 13th century style and vessel form. They, uh, met and combined with people who decorated their pottery like this, with these uh, dowels or, or rods that are wrapped in cordage and pressed into the clay uh, to form a distinct kind of decoration. You can see that's much different. And these people are basically centered in Fort Wayne and the Maumee River Valley. These items, this vessel, and these two uh, you know, items here, among with others, were recovered from the same context, from very secure, buried, um, that we call features. Well, this is really an exciting project for us because Hamilton County Parks has taken a very active uh, role in developing this new state park for archaeological edu or education about archaeology. My name is Nikki Waters. I'm a staff archaeologist here at the Indiana Purdue Fort Wayne Archaeological Survey. We've tried to um, facilitate public access to the site. Um, we've organized multiple tours with school groups um, ranging from elementary age all the way up to high school um, and, and tried to provide activities, small group activities where they could have access to actually excavating within the site, learning how archaeologists dig, um, what our processes and techniques are, why we dig the way we do, and what we're trying to learn and how that impacts their life. We had about five different stations set up for the school groups. Um, one was a generalized nature tour um, hosted by the Park Service where they would learn about um, the different kinds of plants and animals that would have been available in the area. Um, another station was in Indiana Prehistory where we had cultural material laid out from the past 14,000 years of prehistory in the region, which they could, could touch and pick up and we would talk about how people lived at different times. They're living in a very different environment. We would have probably had about a mile of ice that was covering where we're standing right now. Another station we had was a generalized site tour where they could walk around the enclosure and be told what it would have looked like when it was inhabited. Well, that's what archaeology is like. Imagine somebody gives you a jigsaw puzzle, but you don't know how many pieces are in it originally, you don't know how many pieces are missing, um, and you don't know what the picture is going to look like. Another station uh, was the excavation unit where they could actually get in um, 
to the to the excavation unit and learn the techniques of archaeology, learn learn how to dig, why we dig the way we do, what we look for, how to read the soils, um, and then um, have access to screens so that they could sift through the materials that we'd collected afterwards. My name is Alan Patterson and I'm superintendent of Parks and Recreation for Hamilton County. And this property is approximately 750 acres and, and of that uh, we know that a great deal of that land has archaeological significance. I'm certain that we'll have some type of an interpretive facility, um, even with curation uh, facilities here, so we can actually leave the artifacts here, store them here, and be able to show them here uh, what was on this property and help tell that story. At the present time, we're asking everyone that wants to learn more about the site to call and to contact our park department office. Uh, uh, we're asking everyone to go through our, our nature center and our, nat and our naturalist staff and set up an appointment. Um, as you can imagine, we have to be very protective of what we have out here. And, uh, and every, little, every little piece that someone else picks up or that leaves the property is that much more of the puzzle we're not going to be able to put together. Now this is one of our reporters, Paul Owen. Hi, Paul. Hi, guys. Paul recently took Indiana Outdoors to new heights when he went to Greensburg in Decatur County to go skydiving. Wow, and this is only your third jump. I mean, weren't you scared? Well, I actually had a professional strapped to my back. That's called tandem jumping, and it's one of the safest ways to go skydiving. And a great way to get started. Hmm, well, let's see if you kept your cool like Indiana Jones at 13,000 feet. Nah, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Ah, sure. Wait a minute, how did I get here? And who is this guy strapped to my back? My name is David Smith. I'm an instructor at Skydive Greensburg. A tandem skydive is where you have two people going instead of just one. It's uh, where basically the instructor wears the parachute and then the uh, uh, student will wear just a, just a harness that connects two at four points. There's two at the top, two at the bottom. And that's what, that's what you come up with a tandem skydive. The advantage of a tandem skydive versus uh, any other kind of skydive is the ground schooling is a lot quicker. There's uh, brief instructions on how to do the tandem. Uh, you really don't have to take a class. You can come out half an hour be up in the air skydiving. Basically what's going to happen, Paul, I'll hook up four points. I'll tighten the bottom two. We become one person. Okay. We'll walk over to the door together. We get in the doorway. Okay. What I want you to do is put your feet together, knees together, and elbows in. Once we've done that, we're going to go. What I'm going to do is go ready, set, go. When we go out of the airplane, we're just going to fall straight out. Okay. okay. At that point, I want you to bring your head back, arch your body like this, and put both feet between my legs. When I tap you, Paul, bring your hands right to here. Very good. Keeping your head back, feet back, and arch. That's all you got to remember. And the sport is at the point now where virtually anybody can do it. 95% of the people that come out here make one jump, and most of them do tandem. Tandem uh, accomplishes two things. You get the free fall on your first jump, uh, and also, too, uh, you don't have to go through a full day of training because reality is you're just going for the ride. I'm a little bit nervous, but like Bob said, anybody can do this.
Okay, raise your feet up. No, raise them, raise them up. Raise them up. Stand up, stand up. Good job. Woo! Oh! Thanks, guys. That was unbelievable. Dave, Good I just job. want to thank you again for taking me through this. It was awesome. It is the ride. It is the ride of a lifetime. Easy to do? It was easy to do and great to do. I loved it. I just, I absolutely loved it. Um, like I said, Indiana, if I can do it, you can do it. So for Indiana Outdoors, I'm Paul Owen. Wow, nice job, Paul. You really are brave. Aw, thanks, Jill. <laughs> Is it expensive to tandem jump? Well, prices vary, but it's usually about $200 to jump with an instructor. Huh, and then who takes the video on the way down? Well, a professional photographer will take that video for a little extra money. What's next, Paul? Well, if it's outdoors and in the state of Indiana, I'm on it. <laughs> the adventures of superhero Paul to be continued, I guess, huh? Well, our final story today comes from the northernmost part of the state along the shores of Lake Michigan. Our reporter Kelly Clark visited the village of Beverly Shores. dictionary definition of the word unique is one of a kind and Beverly Shores is that and what makes it one of a kind is its natural beauty its closeness to the water we are located about one hour and ten minutes from downtown Chicago we are a unique town in the middle of the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore Park there are not very many towns that can claim that kind of prestige that we're in the middle of a national park. The highest impact on Beverly Shores was the 1933 Century of Progress in Chicago. And it was to celebrate Chicago's 100th anniversary. Now there was a section of the fair called uh, Homes and Industrial Arts and it included 11, and they tend to call them modern houses, but there was a criteria for putting up these houses. Number one, they basically were prefabricated housing, and they were to be uh, affordable by the middle class. And the World's Fair Corporation required anybody who put up a building to post a bond, because many companies just pulled out and we're going to forfeit their bond and let the houses be bulldozed under. Robert Bartlett went in and realized that there was a use for some of the buildings, but he liked and wanted to support some of the architectural techniques, so he actually bought 16 structures from the World's Fair, and his intention was to bring them to Beverly Shores. The World's Fair homes were moved to Beverly Shores in two ways. Twelve of them were dismantled and brought by truck. Four of them were constructed in such a way that they could not be dismantled. So they were loaded at barges at the location of the fair around 23rd Street and brought across the lake on a barge with a tugboat so that it was level with the pier and then they rolled the houses on long pole pines or telephone poles, just the way they have always moved homes since. The interesting thing is in 1929, there were no mechanical means to help them do this. Most of the work was done by draft horses. Beverly Shores is a different kind of resort town today. It's basically a bedroom community. There is no industry here. There is no crime here. We have many, many deer. We have raccoon. We have possums. We have red fox. Probably a hundred different varieties of birds. There are uh, many different ethnic groups. We have many different income brackets. Many, many artists live here, mixed in with the blue collar workers from the steel mills. And everyone living in perfect harmony. The history of Beverly Shores is being preserved by the Beverly Shores Historical Society. The museum and the gallery are run by Beverly Shores residents. We're all volunteers. And we are 
collecting as much Beverly Shores ephemera as we can. And I think it represents the spirit of Beverly Shores, the perseverance, the community feeling, uh, the integrity, the history, and it's here to remind us of how fortunate we are to live in a community like this. Beverly Shores is one of a kind. That's all for our show today. We've enjoyed visiting the Levi Coffin State Historic mm -hmm. Site in Fountain City. I hope you'll visit all the locations that we've seen today. And we'll see you again next time on Indiana Outdoors. Bye-bye. One more time? Yeah, this is a nice house. Sure is.